three. Cool. Don't open your mouth. One. Wait a minute. You didn't learn how World War II ended. There's a hundred and four. We won. So the annual problem for our generation is finding a good way to spend it. Oh. Building a rocket or fighting a mummy or climbing up the Eiffel Tower. I don't know how, but I bet Phineas and Ferb are behind all this. Oh, hi, Candace. I knew it. Have fun. Wait, stop. All right. I guess it's my turn. Phineas and Ferb is insanely important to me. I remember the first time I saw it, they played the roller coaster episode as a preview at their high school musical too. Will you hold it down? I am trying to use the phone. Yeah. So stay tuned for more Ferbalicious fun with Phineas and Ferb. Coming up next, Disney Channel presents an event so big, even the announcer is clueless to what it is. Wait, that, that's me. Come on. The special sneak peek of a new Disney Channel original series starts right now on Disney Channel. Our TVs actually had that Disney Channel East, Disney Channel West shit going on, so best believe I waited three hours to catch it again. I remember telling my grandmother about it a few days later. I think the words that I used were, the people who made this have a really active imagination. Of course, she laughed at me because <laughs> who are you, nigga? Nah, but I think then that was my best way of articulating that I had never seen anything like it before. Like, really think about the first time you saw this plot with all of its interconnecting dots. The whole series was a chain reaction. It was insane. Aren't you a little too old to be talking about Phineas and Ferb? Yes. Yes, I am. Don't you want, like, a life or a girlfriend or something like that? No! Leave, leave me alone. Phineas and Ferb was always one of those shows with layers. There's so many things to talk about. But I've always felt that the way the show looked was always extremely underappreciated. These colors, these designs, these poses. They're a lot more beautiful than I think people give it credit for. And the team's so vast, there's tons of people to think that aren't just Dan and Swampy. They're wasting their time in that swampy marsh. So, for my section of analysis without a cool acronym or Aka, okay, I, guess. I guess I chose to analyze the show's visual style. When I was a kid, there were two names that weren't the creators that I consistently recognized in the opening credits, and those were Robert F. Hughes and Sue Parado. So, we called one of them. Who, uh, when I was when I was timing, Ginger was in three acts, and uh, I asked him. Man, I gotta I, I gotta start I making these people like. Good record some yeah, kind of introduction Michigan, for themselves ain't that the truth ruth oh i hope y'all don't mind i brought my dog with me this time <laughs> ah! mom Phineas and ferb are making a title sequence <laughs> One of Phineas and Ferb's most notable features would have to be its design philosophy. In a world populated with geometric shapes, the design philosophy was built with more dimensionality than the titular Dorito head would suggest. In homage to Tex Avery, the graphic nature of the visuals were a dominant factor through and through. Even going back to the earliest designs, you'll find a lot of shapely features in the characters. Coincidentally, Phineas was the first character ever designed for this concept. His visage is the ultimate Easter egg for the show. Whoa, Phineas, which way are you facing? Good question. Left. There's triangles, triangles everywhere. I found it fascinating that despite how pointed the look of the show could be, the brighter, saturated parts of its color scheme dovetailed off pretty well. Quite intentionally, the one object the series pursued in trying to nail its color scheme was candy, as described by Swampy. The characters were given these bright, sunny colors that pop, while the backgrounds were usually more grounded in realism. Well, I know that uh, Dan wanted, I think, 
you wanted a just a simple look. That's why it's all triangles and shapes and stuff like that at the beginning. Definitely more rigid in the first couple episodes. And then we started getting characters like Vanessa, who really wasn't, you know, a triangle. But that's why, you know, that's why Doof's head's a triangle, Phineas's head's a triangle. It's not like they're related. What we did do was we really focused on uh, the animation of the characters. We focused on it more than a lot of other shows I've worked on because uh, because Dan liked what I did with his stuff on, on Rocco. Working with Family Guy, Dan did a lot of the musical numbers on Family Guy, and he had some tricks that he used, and he drew up a style guide for Phineas. The main thing is uh, the musical numbers, how the musical numbers are presented, that, that they have sort of a, a music video style, that they're proud and they're confident. But that was it. Stylistically, it was all uh, it was all Dan. The show, all every show I've ever worked on changes. The pilot never looks like the last episode. I think it got better, but I I still love those first episodes. They were so simple and so charming. I could I could look at any frame in four seasons of Phineas, and I could tell you who boarded that scene based on the the translation of how the animator interpreted the storyboard. Gimme 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 gimme. So how many? Run. Can I play MP3s and send texts to Stacy at the same time? How about? Hey, wait a minute. All this phone does is make phone calls. So, to me, the best looking episode is Night of the Living Pharmacist. But Rob didn't direct that, so we're just gonna act like it doesn't exist for this video. Yes, he did. I really like the scope of the specials. Anytime the drawings get really loose and Summer Belongs to You is really fun, but. Honestly, I'm gonna go with an honest choice and say Candace Disconnected. Yes, that random season 3 episode where Candace breaks her flip phone. I think about this one a lot, not even in particular for anything extravagant that it does, but more for what it did for me as a fan of not only this series, but animation. Deli brings it up in their video, but Phineas and Ferb isn't a show that people go to directly for its animation. It's probably even underrated in that regard because it really is a consistently beautiful looking cartoon. No, but Candace Disconnected was the first time that I noticed as a kid, oh shit, I really like how this looks. There's a lot of great posing in this, even when the characters are completely still looking at one another in a shot. A lot of shows can't even pull this off. Like, watch this. The Fairly Odd Parents is definitely known for its flat style. It's done on purpose, but look at Timmy when he's just standing around doing nothing. He doesn't feel comfortable or even like he's alive, it's just really flat. Compare this to how Phineas stands, or Candace. Notice their arms. They don't come straight down, instead the elbow sticks out a bit and the back of the hand is pushed forward. The legs aren't straight, there's a slight bend. This gives you the impression that their legs are holding up their weight. One more random thing, the show does a lot of mixed media stuff. I don't even think people realize that it happens here, but it definitely does ever so often. This episode also employs a technique that Rob chopped it up with us about called the upbeat. The other thing from an animation standpoint, something that a lot of people don't understand or they don't think about is the upbeat. I've seen people who draw, you know, somebody dancing, they're like this and put it on the downbeat and then they just flop the image and put it on the other downbeat. So they go like this, you know, back and forth and that's, that's a dance. But what Dan did was he would put an upbeat in it, you know, change the, uh, change the trajectory of the head, you know, depending on what the thing was. And, and that made all the difference in the world that, that made it animatable. And that's something they could handle overseas. That's something our uh, storyboard people didn't necessarily have to draw, but our timers would put it in. If the storyboard artist didn't do that, then the timer would put it in. One of the, uh, one of the bits that I really liked was, uh, uh, song Swinter, when the little girls pop out from behind Phineas and go, bum, 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 bum. Swinter, talk about Swinter, it's a Swinter. Some people call it warmer. <laughs> that was, that was the timer. The timer is the person that made that look good. Her name is, uh, is Barbara Gramashkin. She too was, uh, an animator who fell into television and eventually timing. So look at Doof and Perry here during the Dance Baby sequence. The beat goes boom, 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 boom. Instead of just going from pose to pose, there's a third pose where the characters momentarily stop and hold, a pose in between that builds anticipation. Think of it as a breath. It happens every time I breathe. Watch. Boom, 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 boom. 
Also, when Doof lands, notice that it's not just one frame. He overshoots briefly before he settles. This way, it's not even just on beat, but it's impactful. This is something that Phineas and Ferb has always done. This is probably why you felt like the show had a bigger sense of rhythm than others. Dan Pavemeyer, the show's co-creator, directed on Family Guy and actually did all of the early song sequences. You can really see that this is where he picked this up. They will clean up all your talking in a manner such as this. They will make you take a tinkle when you wanna take a piss. The Family Guy art book is actually really cool. It shows a lot of the storyboards and you can definitely see Dan's style bleed through these. Now, there's actually other episodes of the show that are actually really beautiful as well, but we'll get there. Just, just, just stay with me. You gotta keep this thing organized, son. It's funny. I have a deep appreciation for the visual developments the show made later down the line, but I've always been stuck on season 1's animation style. It's way more loose and fluid in spots. It was before everything was streamlined, so to speak. The staging of episodes like Candace Loses Her Head or One Good Scare Out to Do It really captivated me. In fact, I think the latter was the first episode of the show I've ever seen. In other seasons, Color Stay King, which came out most boldly in musical segments. Any old shot from Roller Coaster the Musical or Christmas Vacation was pretty good at any point, but if you look at the composition for bits in stuff like She's the Mayor or a Split Personality, it can be a captivating experience. What will we do? We'll be right back. Phineas and Ferb is engulfed with really sincere characters with really sincere relationships, but they all kind of do fit a mold. Like, look at Phineas and what he was supposed to be at first. Building a roller coaster in your backyard? Some of it? Wow. Isn't that kind of impossible? Is there something I can do for you? That pitch clip is definitely a classic, but this other clip from the Get You Get You Goo episode almost gave me a damn stroke when I heard it. I'm gonna tell Mom. Okay, tell her what? <coughs> Don't, I'm just gonna tell. Later on, Phineas became much more of an optimist, really pleasant every time he speaks, aside from when his sister fumbles the bag. Get on the trike! Must be a special episode. He's yelling at his sister again. Watching the characters develop is one of the best things about watching Phineas and Ferb in order. Isabella went from blindly oblivious to objectively the only character with some damn sense. Stacy went from enabling all of Candace's actions to telling her, Hey, relax. Monty and Carl developed a friendship. Irving was still trash throughout. Kinda hate this nigga, man. I'm not gonna lie. Y'all remember Doof's original catchphrase? Platypus, but an unexpected surprise. And by unexpected, I mean completely expected! And they're designed well. This video was supposed to be about the visuals, but I don't know what the hell happened. We're just kind of talking now. Yeah. Who's that girl going down the street? It's Candace. So, I think we all know Candace, right? The pencil neck tie strung, perpetually cynical sister, and successful foil to the eponymous title characters. You've seen her fail time and time again to achieve her goal and continue to get back on the horse. At times, she can eclipse the boys in terms of screen presence, but we haven't really seen her take the spotlight before. Sure, she's had her own episodes and quite a few subtle wins given to her, but she's never gotten that doof time, you know? It's interesting because perhaps early on, he'd be such an unassuming piece of the puzzle. Either way, seeing his evolution in the show, not to mention him being embraced as a, a newer mascot for the franchise of sorts, was a wild thing to experience. I've always had a feeling that Candace could get that time, but for some reason they never went too far with her. Yeah, Candace, Candace was tough because you don't want to... Yes! The teams, the teams would divide up responsibility, and usually uh, the women would take Candace. And uh, I would insist on flipping. Kim Roberson, excellent storyboard artist. Such a funny storyboard artist. And her Candace stuff is like really gave her a personality. And it's and it's tough doing that character because you don't want them to be insane. You don't want them to be stupid. They still have to be likable, you know, likable in her distress. And uh, both Kim and Aliki really nailed that. Showed, showed, I love showed that. boys how it's done, you know. You got to do what you know. 
anytime I had to do a female character, I would think of my sisters because I know them. I know them pretty well. <laughs> I've known them my whole life and how they would react. But I come from a big family, and as it turns out, big families act a lot different than, than small families. So my sisters are kind of kind of heavy-handed. But uh, yeah, Candace was a tough character because it would. It's just too easy to make her a villain. A lar large part of the success of that character is definitely Ashley Teasdale. That the way she read the voice was. Just really, she would go different direction with some dialogue, and we'd all go, "Oh, that's totally better," you know. Will you hold it down? I am trying to use the phone. Mom left me in charge, so there'll be no shenanigans today. What are they doing right now? Why do you ask? What do you mean you could see it from your house? See what? We must never speak of this again. Agreed. It's funny how when some characters develop and progress, they often take the others for a ride too. A lot of the kid characters in this universe are thrown out after a few episodes and never heard from again. So it's nice to see them get fleshed out when they do. If you peek at the original concept art, you'll see that characters like Irving and Buford were kind of already accounted for, while Isabella and Baljeet were last minute additions as per Disney's suggestion. All four of those guys luckily got their glory by summer's end, but the latter two in those pairs really deserve some bars. Buford and Baljeet's development is one of the greatest experiences to emerge from this show. To this day, I still think about the utopia we'd live in if Frenemies got an album release. To cut it short, Baljeet's more minute, antiquated characterizations were updated as per an internal push, and his rewrite drug his bully along for the ride. He got a bit more bite, a lot more snark at the top of his voice. Not to mention, he was allowed to flex his impressive set of pipes. Pause. What the fuck? Buford didn't really lose his edge. Like, he's not really a bully anymore, but he started to understand what he had and the fact that he could not do bad all by himself. It's just an amazing dynamic. I'm glad he got the time to build and grow. I think we have to take it up a notch. We, we started off kind of rocky on Balji. Swampy and I worked with a guy named Balji, so that's where he came from. And it was for the bully episode where the bully was gonna pick on Phineas, but then he started picking on Balji, and I'm kind of like, uh, this, this isn't a good thing, you guys. This is like, you know, it, I just don't like bully stuff. So they became best friends. And Buford, it, it turned into sort of a, you know, older brother kind of thing, which is more, I think that's more acceptable. Cause I got a bigger brother. I got a big older brother who did that to me, you know? Even when they grew up, it was like, they're still hanging out together. <laughs> you know? They're still best friends. There was a lot of stuff that came up in animatic. Vanessa Doofenshmirtz, in that first episode that she was in, that wasn't that wasn't Doof's daughter. That was his lab assistant. And so, Perry the Platypus, let me introduce to you my assistant, Vanessa. Oh, whatever. <laughs> She's new. As the lab is blowing up, she's taking the last escape pod. The line was, I'm taking the last escape pod. And then he's like, okay, bye. And I added, I'm so out of here. This is the worst bring your daughter to work day ever. And uh, <laughs> Dan added, tell your mother you had fun though. So from then on, Doofenshmirtz had a had a daughter. That's where Vanessa came from. It wasn't it wasn't written that way. It wasn't planned that way. It just came out as a, as a one-off in, in animatic. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about King of the Hill for a second. I've been watching a lot of it recently and have continuously been overwhelmed by how good it is. It made me rearrange my whole top five. That's how in love I am with this show. Around Father's Day, we got into an argument with a friend of mine, Black Geeky Girl, who thinks Dr. Doof is a better dad than Hank Hill. Hi, I'm Black Geeky Girl, and I think Dr. Doof is a better dad than Hank Hill. So, as Rob said, Heinz Doofenshmirtz has a daughter, Vanessa, who may or may not have a really weird I'll wait till you grow up as relationship with fur, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not equipped 
Enough to analyze that. Really, the King of the Hill argument boiled down to the fact that while Dr. D continuously tries, his overbearing personality won't allow him to directly listen to his daughter's wants and needs. Doof so blindly wants to do things that'll make him a great parent and well liked by his daughter, but doesn't listen to her enough to understand what those things are. Look at me, I'm 16 years old. 16. That's practically an adult, but you still treat me like I'm a little kid. I just need some space, that's all. Are you even listening to me? There's also the component of respect, right? Vanessa does not respect Heinz. She continuously lets that be known. She even says the lyrics, you were a substandard dad, but the only one I had. The arc between these two throughout the run is focused on Vanessa respecting who her dad is and what he does, compared to Hank, who not only listens to Bobby, but is respected by him throughout, if you don't consider the pilot. Don't you see I'm working here? Close the dang door. Uh, uh, Bob, just keep put, stop, stop hitting that button. Give me that thing. And I think this is a valuable comparison because of Hank and Heinz's makeup as men. They both had traumatic childhoods and don't let that affect how open-minded they are with their children. If anything, it drives them. I had to work as a lawn gnome. I was forced to wear hand-me-up girls' clothing. Neither of my parents showed up for my birth. Every single thing that has happened to them should have made them the worst parents on the face of the earth, but instead they use that as a way to see how they don't want their kids to grow up. That's real shit coming from a guy who claps really loud at piano recitals. You're my punk rock boyfriend. You're not supposed to think my dad is cool. It only matters that I think he's cool. So bad so bad so not so bad. Party. But if it were a party, it would not be their party, it would be my party! Candace party! Candace party! It's not a party, it's an intimate get-together! Candace party! Candace party! Don't call it that, it's just a get-together! Candace party! Candace party! I'm not sure if I really have a favorite character. I never thought about it before or even had to until my goofy ass put this in the outline. I'm always really fascinated by the characters that time forgot. Ones that the writers just kind of went, eh, never mind. Like Coltrane, son, where the hell is Coltrane? I love Corbin Blue. I love jumping. I love the Disney family sing along. Honestly, after some continuous thought, I know I just made Deli do that read on Candace, but I think that's my final answer. I'm locking that in. Candace is definitely the character that's allowed to be pushed and pulled crazy often. She's the one allowed to have the widest range of poses and emotions. Because of this, even though her goal and logic behind it are ridiculously cartoonish, I think it helps her feel more real. I've seen a disgusting amount of race face to gear up for the retrospective that I'm doing on the show, and writing this made me realize how similar Sharon and Candace are, in the vein that they both let their insecurities drive the decisions that they make. Oh no, Jeremy didn't give me a nickname? Does he not like me? Oh no, no one's answering the phone. Do, do they not want to be my friends anymore? Oh no. Braces, my nigga, shit crazy. Boyfriends? Forget about it, my life is complicated. But the difference is that Candace only lets this affect her, not how she treats others. She doesn't drag them down with her, that's just not in her nature. I think it's pretty compelling and it plays into the likability that Rob was talking about before. Answer. Subject to change though, I didn't really have time to think this through all crazy. That's not, it's not a party. <clears throat> so, how about that airline food? <laughs> I think any character out of the main quintet is worthy of bars, but I've always been a Ferb guy personally. Not necessarily because he's a man of all consuming mystery, because he's just so fascinating by default. I appreciate that while being a very eccentric person, even by Danville standards, he's still just a guy. A guy that lets Phineas get whatever crazy shit he wants to get off. He revels in the chaos while appearing to not be phased at all. I imagine it mirrors a bit of Dan and Swampy's dynamic and honestly it's just the perfect image. Ferb, tell them what you told me. Right? 
I'm living in Crazy Town, and Finney's in Ferb, our town council. As a kid, I was always down for Ferb to say more or extend himself, because while he didn't really need to, I always felt like he deserved much more time. But let's be honest here, Phineas was hogging some damn good project space. He needed to share the clout. I think that was a subtle attribute alluded to more in the early days than later, because Ferb is just humble like that. Despite where he ended up, or at one point he and his brother were at, he was always fairly supportive. Yeah, he had his limits, but for the most part, he's in the heat of the moment just as much as anyone else. There's just so much more I can gush about for ages. He has a lot to offer. So long as he don't catch you at the Disney parks acting the fool. I think my favorite episode is uh, Summer Belongs to You. It was supposed to be a movie, but uh, something happened and it boiled down to an hour. So Dan and Swampy had worked on the story a lot. The grand finale at the end, the uh, encapsulation of what a great day it was. That was all Dan and Swampy. Because they, they were working on that stuff, hoping that, that it would become a movie. And then it didn't, and it, it kind of got weird. And then I jumped in and made it happen. That's got uh, the song Rubber Bands, Rubber Balls in it. Rubber Bands, Rubber Balls, made with super special density. My first, my first Bollywood number. And uh, welcome to Tokyo. Forget about it. Hey, everybody, Phineas and Farber here. Wow, Stacy sure has a lot of cousins. Ah. I had to write uh, Welcome to Tokyo. And I've never been to Tokyo. I don't know. I mean, I know as much about Japan as anybody, you know, and, and uh, a lot of my references are like old movies from the 40s and you don't want to touch that stuff. So uh, what I did was uh, I looked up Tokyo and I wrote a little essay about Tokyo. A lot of people in Tokyo love to play baseball uh, in the summer and this and that. And I wrote this little essay, Welcome to Tokyo. We're glad that you're here. Let me tell you a little something about Tokyo. And I took the entire thing and I put it into Google Translate and I translated it into Japanese. And then I grabbed the Japanese and I translated it back into English. And then we had this, oh my God, oh, being glad that you are here. You came visiting delightful us. Welcome to Tokyo. Oh my God. <laughs> That's exactly what we did. It's like, uh, as for the list of exotic amusements. Uh, amusement And then I wanted to do like a full anime thing, but, and here's where I got burned on the internet meme. There was a internet meme years ago where they'd have every character doing this stupid dance. It was called the caramel dance. And it was based on some Swedish song or something. And so I just had them all doing that because I thought it was internet weird. So I was trying to do that. It was supposed to be a big question mark. And I got a lot of blowback on the internet. People are like, that's caramel dancing. They don't do that in Star Range, Jesus. You know. Man, Tokyo's a fun town. I have no idea what just happened. So Phineas, what do you think of the city of love? I wish it was the city of airplane parts. Oh, you're just too stressed. You should take a moment to relax and enjoy it. There's a scene in there too where uh, Candace sees her boyfriend with other people and she loses her nerve to talk to them and there's a sad French song playing in the background. You don't even hear it. You don't even hear the song but I wrote the song and uh, so we decided to do like an you know like an old 20s torch song from from Paris and the lyrics were basically uh, right out of the translation book. It was like, and one of the lines was something like, how would I say this in French? In French. <laughs> I made, a, I made a little thing about that one too because it's like nobody ever heard the song it just kind of played a little bit and you could kind of hear it in the background and it was it was bookended by two really good bits the first bit where Candace is trying to find out directions to La Flavel to meet Jeremy and she's asking a French girl who speaks English but she's going through a French dictionary and it's just this mess La Flavel means the wastebasket I think <laughs> it's uh, just around the corner oh around the corner around the corner uh Hey, Hotel Babel, which is around the corner. <laughs> the the first song with uh, I believe we can with Clay and Shaka Khan. <laughs> Shaka Khan, forget about it. <laughs> yeah, man. I was going I was going Mavis Staples. I wanted Mavis so bad, but uh, Dan kind of zeroed in on Shaka Khan. It's like forget about it. It's great, you know. 
And she came out dressed like fur. It was hilarious. Mm -hmm. And I especially like the Paris part because I that's all based on my experience in Paris. I, I worked in Europe briefly. I love Paris. I think it's just a fascinating city. Vanessa appropriating a scooter. There was a lot of buried gags in there. The City of Love song, I love that. That was uh, Chris Hedrick boarded that. Mm -hmm. And of course you gotta put a mime in there. Any chance I get, I'm gonna have a mime. He's gonna come out and he's gonna show that he has a broken heart on this thing and then let go of a balloon. And it, it was too much, they just wanted one thing. So I, we just had the mime come out just like, like hope fleets away. And the guy's like, hey, quick. And the balloon guy like chasing. <laughs> <laughs> hey you, stop letting my balloons go. Oh, it's got the best line in it where Isabella's like fessing up to Phineas after Phineas gives up. It's a huge moment when when Phineas loses it, you know, and he only does it in the special episodes. And he just gives up and Isabella says, this isn't the Phineas that I fell into this situation with. That was just such a great moment. That was uh, that that whole beach scene was uh, Mike Dietrich, the baby head guy. Summer Belongs to You is an enigma, no cap. It's a wonder kind for the rest of the show to look to and try to hit later down the line. Visually, it's an advancement. Narratively, it's an achievement. Musically, it's pretty much unmatched. But let's actually talk about it instead of <laughs> posturing for ages. The greatest achievement Summer Belongs to You has under its belt is its ability to paint the most vivid picture of the show. Anybody who's seen a minute of it knows it to be a brighter series in philosophy and color palette. That said, the special found a way to funnel its actions into words and perfectly convey why it does the things that it does. More directly, the Flynn Fletcher's conversation under a Parisian bridge brings basically everything to light. More symbolically, of course, the climax on the deserted island basically illuminates the whole world of the series. It's not possible to talk about Phineas and Ferb without bringing up how good Summer Belongs to You is, right? I remember the night this came out watching it on my homeboy's big ass TV in his living room. Summer Belongs to You was the first time for me that the series felt gigantic. Look at these early morning covers. I can't get over how good this looks. This acting on Candace and Stacy, the drawings of Shaka Khan. I've talked about it a little earlier, but the drawings are really allowed to get loose in this one. Here we are in the future. When I think of a cartoon that consistently plays with its colors, Steven Universe is always the first one to come to mind. Every episode seemed like an experiment with shading, tone, and mood. They did some things with color that I've never even seen done before or since. Phineas and Ferb was always designed to be a really bright show, really poppy saturated colors. But Summer Belongs to You always stands out to me because for the first time, everything wasn't consistently bright. There was dawn, there was a sunset. These evening colors at the end, when the sun sets, forget about it, it's beautiful. Summer Belongs to You, to me, is the show's most pivotal point of no return. This is the point where they fully embrace their MO and never let go. It's like the best series finale we've ever gotten, and it's not even halfway through the show. It not only encapsulates everything that makes for a prime Phineas and Ferb adventure, but it leaves everyone with more than a bit of inspiration to live out in their lives like they are the longest days of the year. 104 days is such a finite amount of time to to seize the day. But if you can take this special to heart, you'll find that summer can belong to you in any season, every year, for life, so long as you really embrace what it has to offer. I've always maintained that Summer Belongs to You is a bit more theatrical than the actual film across the second dimension. Rewatching the film, there's definitely a few standout moments, but whenever it gets the chance, it definitely slips back into the normal look of the show. Every time I rewatch it, I always get excited for the Guzum scene. These poses are insane, the animation is so loose and expressive here. I wish this whole film looked like this, but I'll always respect the choice to do this kind of stuff economically. Nintendo brought it up in his video, but making front-facing Phineas look good is always a big fat W. But I wonder whose choice this was. The CG's... okay. At least they don't use it to do... 3D Matrix shots with Phineas's head, I probably would've threw up. Across the Second definitely has my favorite bit of character acting in the whole show, though. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm confused. Why does their platypus fight so good? <laughs> Bury the platypus! I just really appreciate the mood Summer Belongs to You sets. Being visually eye-catching throughout while also not straying away from the design philosophies the show is known for. And like Deli said, I like how the ending song can be used to be sung to the audience. 
Summer doesn't just belong to Phineas. It also belongs to a certain gentleman in this room. Who, me? Yeah, sure. Hey, where's Perry? Would you like your with or without fromage? The specials, you know, that last one was tough. That was like, oh no, saying goodbye to your friends, you know. We had a lot of moments in that one. Yeah, for the most part, the specials like Star Wars and Marvel, parodies are easy. They're, mm -hmm. they're totally easy because everything's all set up for you. And uh, I really did like the uh, take that they did on the idea that they came up with to run parallel to the start to uh, the New Hope story, sort of in a uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead scenario, you know, and that was fun. Plus I had 25 years of Star Wars jokes that I need to do a catalog, <laughs> you know. I just like to go to the catalog and take out a card. All right, plastic armor, Sarlacc kit. Yeah. My life yeah. is, is one big Sarlacc kit. In my life's one big Sarlacc kit. But the one song I remember we had the worst time with was the Tatooine song. You can look, but you're never gonna find a better place to be. We wow, really? We couldn't come up with enough of what we liked about Tatooine. <laughs> it's like, now when you think about it, it's like, it's a desert planet. I guess there's a, you know, there's the Sarlacc pit and there's the, you know, Tashi station, which is, you know, a wretched hive of scum and villainy. It's like, you can't, Phineas, I just love wretched hives of scum. Scum and villainy, you know. We had two people that were big Star Wars fans on that. Uh, John Mathot was one of our storyboard guys, and Kyle Minky, also one of the storyboard guys. You know, uh, John Mathot had a, a blog about Star Wars. He loved it so much. And we we're like, get in here, Mathot. What's great about Tatooine? He's like, Rrr. and we were dipping into stuff. It's like, well, in the video game, uh, this is in the video game. Or, you know, it was just stuff that, that wasn't in the original movie that we kind of borrowed from um, Anchor Tower or something like that. There was a bunch of stuff that, it, and it took us the longest time to write that stupid song. But uh, I think it came out. Uh, and then Mark and I did, uh, did the, uh, the vamp song in that one where uh, Vanessa the Twilight, oh, solo. I'm feeling solo. <laughs> I know whose ship that is. Whose? Han Solo. Solo. Solo's been a thorn in my side for years. Isabella actually shoots somebody. Solo, 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 Would you excuse me? Solo. Yeah, we should probably get going. Well. Phineas and Ferb Star Wars actually has my favorite scene in the history of this show. After pretty much leaving the boys for dead in the vein of the fight not being hers, Isabella goes to a bar to kind of just get some things off her mind. At the same time, Han Solo and Chewbacca enter as well for pretty much the exact same reason. I love everything about this scene. The lines of dialogue that they say to each other are so masterfully written. They don't even tell each other what their problems are. You can tell they got some kind of history and it's not explained, but it doesn't need to be. Isabella's written is really cold throughout the course of the special, much like Han Solo in A New Hope. I think. I don't know. I ain't never seen a movie before. What happened, Solo? Garbage scout tip over and dump you here? What are you doing here, Isabella? Did someone run out of cupcakes? Very funny. Both of them are fighting for dominance over the scene, but then... Solo says a trigger. I'm not in this to make friends. Yeah, obviously. What do you mean by that? Isabella's face has remained consistently nonchalant this whole time, but here we get a reaction from her. She's stunned that she was called out for this, and we get an immediate reaction, instantly defensive. I've got friends. I've got plenty of friends. Yeah? Where are they now? Hans has taken the power over this scene and remains there. Isabella has no retort, no answer. For the first time, she's forced to think. And her reaction is so realistic. It's a real, I know you are, but what am I moment. Well, where are yours? <laughs> Put a sock in it, fuzzball. 
While Chewbacca's dialogue is inaudible, you can pretty much get from context that he's like, yo, my nigga, we gotta go back. Look at this slow realization on Solo's face. It's insane. Anger, realization that he's serious, thinking, anger at the thought of doing the right thing, and acceptance. I don't know, I don't directly go to Phineas and Ferb for his cinematography, but man is this scene beautiful with his colors lighting and blocking. We even bid it a little bit for Power K back in high school. And you know, who would I be if I didn't ask the director about my favorite scene? Definitely not Toonrific Tariq. Probably Toonrific Tyreek though, I don't know who that is. That was story um, by Kyle Minky. Kyle basically animated his storyboard. Like almost all that action you see in there is directly from the board. Which is, which at the time was kind of a rarity. A lot of people do it now, I do it now. But uh, Kyle was one of the first people I think that would animate the scene. Yeah, we, we kind of went back and forth on that one. It's just like, uh, yeah, the punchline of that one was good. I forget what it was. It was uh, hanging out with all your friends, you know, what a garbage scow tip over and dump you, dump you here, you know, space gags. Maybe you're right. Maybe I do have some place to be. See you around, Isabella. He is right. Uh, additionally, I mean, by the time we got around to A New Hope, it was how many years after this I saw the movie the first time? And there was, there was a bunch of stuff in the movie that I'm just like, if I ever get a chance, I'm going to make fun of that. I mean, these nobody could hit anything with their guns. <laughs> they couldn't hit shit. And, and uh, additionally, it's like, they're wearing plastic. So I got I finally got to say my, my plastic armor joke or Buford. Right here. Baby, you're wearing armor. are you expecting someone? Not them. It was wild hearing about the various crossovers Disney allowed to take place. Of all the franchises and series under its belt, this was the main one to get all the glory. Deadass, I was kinda jonesing for a Muppets crossover by series end. Mission Marvel is not hard to jump into even as a casual fan of either property, but it's a romp through and through and a really fun one at that. They made it look effortless, but you can bet there was a metric fuck ton of time poured into the mechanics of making this possible. Oh, that was a blast. I, I, we didn't, I mean, this was, when we did it, it was before uh, the big Avengers movie. I mean, Thor, I think Thor had just come out and they were just, and you know, that first Thor movie. I didn't know nothing. I have, I have worked on uh, Marvel projects before. I worked on a show called Superhero Squad. Marvel always gave notes. Always, they were very strict with their notes because they were protecting, they were protecting their brand. And we had a scene where, uh, in, in our thing, where everybody got each other's powers. Thor got Spider-Man's powers and Spider-Man got Hulk's powers and Hulk got Iron Man's powers and Iron Man got Thor's powers. That was it. And uh, they're having a fight. So Iron Man with Thor's powers grabs his hammer and throws it. And uh, in the note session after the pitch, they said, well, he can't pick up a hammer. He's not. No, no, he's got his powers, you know. So Dan, Dan started I don't know, he started like arguing with Marvel and uh, I know for a fact you can't argue down either of those. You can't argue down Marvel and you can't argue down Dan. So <laughs> they had both met their match and they were going back and forth. It's like, well, what if, what if, you know, and it's this whole Big Bang Theory thing. What if uh, he puts his uh, hammer down on an elevator? Would the elevator still go up? And Iron Man's in the elevator? He's not worth it, but it's the elevator, you know. And they're doing this whole thing off. It's like, what the fuck? can you fly? It's like, you can't fly without the hammer. And I'm, as they're talking, I'm writing all of this down. Because <laughs> I knew the damn would be, what are we gonna do? This is stupid, what are we gonna, you know, he's gonna get, he's gonna get mad about it. And I'm like, on the way out, I'm like, dude, I got an idea. <laughs> so I, I literally, not, not literally, but I, I took all the notes that I took of him arguing with Marvel, and we just gave the lines to Iron Man and Thor. Wielding Mjolnir is about worthiness, not power. Really? It's a fine distinction, but an important one. Potato, potato. I do not know what that means. Okay, never mind. What about the lightning? How do I control that? Actually, that only works with the hammer. What about flying? I've seen you fly. Well, yes. 
but not without not the hammer. Not without the hammer, right. So that's, they, they had this little exchange like that. So that was fun. And I never, I didn't read superhero comics, so it didn't, I, I kind of went with the flow on that one. But uh, I will say in uh, the Avengers movie that we scooped them, that building with the robots coming out, we totally scooped them because we did that in the second dimension. Doof's Tower had the robots coming out of it from another dimension. Yeah, we scooped them by about a year. Although, although I never know, maybe one of the writers read the comic book or something. But uh, I, I was pretty proud of that. <laughs> read my fan fiction. It's a story where Thor and Hulk decide to learn ice skating. I'm but sorry, but we're not allowed to accept unsolicited material. Phineas and Ferb is a cartoon I'm glad to have grown up with because I think its occurrence was rather coincidental. Like it's an old soul trapped in a zoomer's body, but the curveballs it can throw at us mean way more than one would expect. Throughout this thing's run, it taught us to embrace things through the lens of spontaneity. Summer and any other time of year is easily what you make of it, but you can't spend too long thinking about it, or else it'll be gone within the blink of an eye. It's a message that transcends the universe itself and directly mirrors how many would probably see the show. Way back when, there was a time when I'd probably never want to see this show end. It was only during that incredibly long gap in season 4 that I'd questioned what my time with it was and what it had been like. What did the journey amount to? Were you really satisfied? Was there anything left that you wanted to see? The original show went on for eight years, much longer than many other cartoons. It's easy to believe that the idea of an endless summer is a palatable one in this universe, but it's anything but. The idea of living spontaneously is not about living in it forever, but having such a good time that perhaps it'll stick with you forever. While it wasn't one of my favorite moments spent with the show, Last Day of Summer was my official bookend. It put me at ease, it was my time to give it a rest. So seeing this still around feels kind of weird. As you know, this whole event leads up to this new movie, and though the premise is one I welcome with open arms, I'm not sure how to feel about this franchise's continuation. It's a lot to process, but as long as they keep making Summer Last, I can't help but live for those moments. Well, I, I will say that Phineas uh, was a lot of fun for me. It was, uh, the nice thing was I was I was comfortable there, and I think most of the people who worked there were comfortable working on the show. They felt like their efforts were appreciated and that uh, their input was heard. Yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a fun group and it was always changing. It was always new people were coming in, people were going out. Pretty much everyone in animation worked on the show at one point, I think. Well, I'm here. Now where's this giant animation studio? It got up and it danced away. It what? It got up and it danced away. Phineas and Ferb is an animated series that I can talk about for hours. Honestly, this video was supposed to be longer on some Penny Proud Unplugged shit, but I low-key ran out of time. Since I first saw it in 2007, that night after High School Musical 2, it always had a permanent place in my heart. Phineas and Ferb premiered when I was in fourth grade. It ended the summer before my senior year of high school. I actually counted, son. I, I cried like seven tears during the finale. I'm a bitch baby, my G. I remember the night it ended, I watched it with a few friends. One of them said something along the lines of, they did it all, and now it's our turn. <laughs> it's corny as shit, but it's actually pretty valid, I think. Phineas and Ferb always let the audience know that they could do anything that the boys did, and then some. Make every day count, do something that you enjoy. Just, <laughs> just... Just make sure that there's a pharmacist down the block that could take care of the cleanup for you. All this time, the boys were only trying to show you the fun way to go. The joy is in the journey, you know. Oh, wait, you know what? I almost forgot the most important part. Have fun, everybody. I, for one, am starting to get bored. And boredom is something up with which I will not put. The first thing they're going to ask us when we get back to school is what do we do over summer? Around, That's easy for you, and yes, home, look at all the things you've done. Summer belongs to you. It belongs to everyone. And the joy is in the journey. The only thing that's impossible is impossibility. As always, HP, it is imperative that your cover identity as a mindless domestic pet remains intact. You're a secret agent? All right, follow me. We're going on clockwise. Brother is a 
brother. But I couldn't have asked for a better one than her. <laughs> It gets hard to watch. You guys are amazing! Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, 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 oh! Mom! 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 Give it a rest, Candace! Listen, just thank you. Thank you so much for doing this with us. It's been it's really been great. Thank you. Um, and uh, I like what you I like your stuff. I like thank your you. Stuff. Man. I really appreciate that. Charlotte, who's giving that donkey to you? <laughs>